I got this grotty old bag out and told you I was about to administer some drugs into your system, you might be a bit on edge. And I wouldn't blame you, but this is something far less sinister than that. On the front it says Model 8820 Programmer, Medtronic, and inside is something wonderful. Let's delve in. Also, thank you to my sponsor, Kaspersky. Yes. Yes, Medtronic 8820. This is a certain bag for a certain job. It's also a little tatty and grotty in places, but inside is a treasure of wonder and wires and printer rolls. Of course, the main star is this Epson Action Note 4000 laptop or notebook if you prefer, and it actually plugs directly into this metal slab built into the case, along with a parallel and serial connection. But look at this precious thing, it's absolutely tiny, and actually it served an incredibly important purpose. First I'll talk about what that purpose is, and afterwards we can delve into this beauty of a notebook in more detail. So, Medtronic was founded in 1949 by Earl E. Bakken and his brother-in-law Palmer Hermansley. Operating out of a garage in northeast Minneapolis, they initially set to work repairing medical equipment for hospitals. By 1957, having made excellent relationships with physicians and staff, they moved into equipment manufacture and created the first battery-powered wearable pacemaker. They quickly moved on to a fully implantable device before expanding into other areas, including implantable defibrillators and spinal cord stimulators. And really, the culmination of this work and knowledge allowed them to produce the SynchroMed implantable infusion system, with the first test patient implanted in 1982. After extensive clinical trials, it was commercially released in the US during 1987 and can be used for chemotherapy medication, pain management and intractable spasticity, among others. The core of this technology is the lithium-powered infusion pump. Once implanted, it can be refilled through a tube and it can be programmed to administer varying amounts of drug through this an external programmer. This setup is one of the first, and what I have here is the 1994 revision based around the much more portable Epson Action Note. On initial boot we get various BIOS checks informing us of the whopping 4 megabytes of RAM and rapid 33 megahertz clock speed before reporting that the CMOS battery has naturally died, but we'll get back to those later. The action note is set to boot straight into a program called Medtronic SynchroMed System, and it's from here that you can control the dosing of the patient's infusion pump using this. Now, it may look like an irregular mouse or a hand scanner, but wired straight into the chassis of this case, it's actually an external programmer which uses radio frequency to communicate with the SynchroMed. You know, you can control infusion modes, rates, even check the volume of drug left in the reservoir with the connection signal indicated by these lights on the top of the hand unit. Of course, I don't have a patient with an installed synchro med to hold this up to, and even if I did, I'm clearly not qualified or suitable enough to do so, but honestly, I find it fascinating to think that this thing was lugged about from patient to patient to ensure that their implanted device was doing the right thing at the right time, and saving lives fundamentally. Once your patient is done, you can use the built-in thermal printer to whip off some notes on dosage or anything else. It's configured to just do its job simply and quickly. It's interesting, there could be numerous customer records on this notebook, but thankfully on this occasion the data has been wiped. There's not much left on this hard drive at all. But it got me thinking about the online world we live in and how much more permanent and spread out our data is now. Music apps, social media, customer logons, 
Even through search, we leave a trail of our activity and personal information. So what, you might say, which is fine until this stuff is used against you. It's so easy for someone to do a search of your name, for instance, along with a few unsavory terms and use anything they find to harm you. I mean, check this guy. He's got glasses and a beard. Dodgy as hell. You know, maybe it's a future employer or someone you've just upset in the past. Our online trail is long and very hard to control, so it's important to make sure you stay on top of it. Kaspersky's Privacy Checker can help you hugely in this regard. Whether you're setting up Instagram, TikTok, WhatsApp, LinkedIn, YouTube, even Windows 10. Set your desired privacy level and the online tool can inform you exactly how to batten down the hatches and keep everything secure. The instructions are straightforward, accurate and always up to date, which is important. Maybe someone out to cause harm or stifle your chances doesn't worry you, but the fact that companies are literally building profiles of our online activities for their own marketing might. In either case, you can find out which parts of your online life you need to change and how to tweak the settings to effortlessly enforce them. Unfortunately, we're no longer in the 90s, so please do take a look at the link below to clean up your modern life. It's free and very straightforward. So what's in the guts of this thing? Well, the action note is connected to this bottom metal box through its serial port, parallel port, and it also appears to be earthed at this point here. Unscrew all of these and the box below yields this vision of Electronica. So over here we've got the controller card for the SynchroMed programmer. There's an NEC D78320L chip, which is actually a 16-bit CPU combined with a ROM, RAM and real-time pulse control that facilitates operation of the SynchroMed motor. Then we've got some RAM and control chips surrounding it. Over here, of course, we've got the power supply for the action note, which would normally be housed in your standard brick. Pretty interesting, but of course, we can disconnect all this medical equipment altogether, and then we're left with the purity of the action note itself. And I really like this thing, it just feels so nice. The surface is matte, it almost feels like it's been sandblasted. We've got a PS2 port, and curiously, a VGA out in addition to our standard rear ports. And, you know, as a whole, this thing is so tiny, it puts the portability of most modern laptops to shame. But if we take a trip back to 1993, it wasn't particularly special. In fact, the Action Note was battling a lot of similar and even superior competition. In November 1993, Byte magazine were one of the first to review it, pitting it head to head with the mighty IBM ThinkPad 500, under the classification of sub notebooks. The guiding idea behind sub notebooks has been compromise on features to shed pounds. The result is systems under four pounds, but with external floppy drives and less processing power, smaller screens, cramped keyboards, shorter battery life, and higher prices than standard notebooks. A tough category to fit in, and you can see that the ThinkPad 500 beats it in almost every way. The late March edition of PC Magazine in 1994 also got in on the act, this time using a scatter chart, but with a similar outcome. And part of that is down to the CPU Epson decided to run with, a Cyrix 33MHz 486SLC. Power efficient, compact, but it had a disadvantages. Now, the SLC might carry the 486 label, but really it's just a supercharged 386. It has a 486 instruction set and 1K of level 1 cache, but relies on the 386SX's 16-bit data path, meaning a standard full-blown 32-bit 486 would leave it dead in the water. It also lacks a maths coprocessor, although the motherboard does have space to fit one to improve the situation. But other than that, I really quite like the whole setup. This one has the top-end 120 megabyte IDE drive, which as you can see has been cloned especially for its medical use. 
It's got a 64 grayscale LCD, which is controlled by a Sirius Logic chipset, and we've got some nice adjustment features built in. It also has a built-in trackball on the top right of the keyboard. Not great for left-handed people, but fine for most. And all of this fits in a package of 10 by 7.5 by 1.5 inches. It's really small. Now, I didn't receive the external parallel floppy with mine. You can set it to boot from that in the BIOS if you want, but it does have another neat trick. On boot, you may notice it loads a card talk driver and assigns the D drive to it. This actually allows you to use the PCMCIA slot as an additional drive. Of course, we need to stop it auto booting into the Medtronic program, as once we're in, there doesn't seem to be a way to get out of it other than rebooting. But I bought a PCMCIA compact flashcard reader to see what we could do. And apparently, waiting a day for Amazon Prime to deliver it meant the hard drive decayed enough to actually destroy the card talk driver, or, you know, corrupt it enough to make it hard to run. I literally had to hold the drive in front of a heater to get it to manage to even start to read it. But I couldn't get it to read this particular card anyway, not with these settings. No! No, why can't I read you? But given the hard drive wasn't playing ball enough for me to tweak the settings, I decided to go down a different route. I mean, ultimately, I just want to see what Doom is like on this thing. So behind the plastic panel, which has been sellotaped down, I was able to take the drive out, plug it into a modern PC, and, well, either the drive died completely or Windows 10, for whatever reason, refused to acknowledge it at all. It might even have been that the IDE reader just couldn't configure it properly. Likely the latter. So, plan, what are we on, C? This involved an alternative drive, Toshiba again, but this time a whopping 80 gigabyte IDE drive. And See if you can guess the problem here. I tried setting it up to boot into DOS using a utility called Bootis, copied some files over, and then, well, I realized that the little BIOS on this Epson doesn't appreciate hard drives over 8 gigabytes, which is incredibly common on these old machines. This Epson still has a BIOS where you need to configure the drive type by cylinders, heads, sectors, and so on. It doesn't even have an auto configure, so it gets a little upset when you whop something so large in. <laughs> and that's what she's. So that compact flash card I was trying to use before can be repurposed as a hard drive if you happen to have an IDE adapter. Here's one I had shipped in, but even with this, there are still issues to overcome. First of which is that making a flash drive bootable without a floppy drive isn't as simple as you might think. Tools like the former mentioned Bootis or Rufus can write master boot records and make USB sticks bootable, but old machines like this aren't really too fond of the output. What I had to do was rather more complex. For this, I opted instead to use this adapter, which allows you to connect an SD card up to IDE instead. This Epson actually has a further BIOS limitation, meaning it can only recognize a 500 megabyte drive. So this half gig SD card is perfect. To configure it, I decided to plug the whole shebang into a USB IDE reader, just so there were no discrepancies, and then went about getting a bootable version of DOS 6.22 installed, the best version of DOS. The trick to this was to use VirtualBox and make it believe the SD card is a virtual drive. Then perform a standard DOS install using disk images, which should in theory make this SD card appear as a normal bootable DOS drive. There's an excellent guide to do this, which I have linked below. So once I'd F disked the hell out of it, got the DOS setup disk to format it and then installed everything, it was time to copy Doom across and give it a go. Hmm. 
well, after I worked out what the drive settings this SD card adapter needs. Obviously, this thing doesn't have cylinders and heads like a conventional hard drive. You can run a DOS command to call up some drive info, but these values are more like placeholders and they don't always work when put into old machines. In the end, I had to tweak the values so that the calculated drive size was spot on. And then... This is a moment. Oh my god. I've been trying to get that laptop to boot to DOS for, for days. For, for, abs for hours. Hours on end. Without a floppy drive. And finally, it actually works. Yes. Now, now we can play Doom. And it is pretty unplayable. Although on this screen it's evident you wouldn't want to. I imagine this is how a drunk cat would perhaps perceive the world. Not just that though, you can really feel the wannabe 486 chip crumbling under the pressure. Of course, Windows works perfectly and everything boots fast. Oh. Thanks to the SD card. Although you quickly realize that the trackball is actually a piece of crap. Especially as the only place you can rest your hand is directly on the keyboard. Nice design, chaps. Here we go. Solitaire runs a bit better than Doom, at least. Maybe not the flying Windows screensaver, though. The hot dog theme looks, well, it looks just like any other theme on this screen. Disappointing. Hot dog stand looks fairly respectable. What we need to do is hook up an external monitor and then... Oh, pepper colour. That is nice. Get this colourful beast of a lifestyle. Look at that. Your whole world is transformed. Doom even feels faster thanks to the lack of screen ghosting that is a bit jerky little bit unplayable and windows hot dog looks well it looks like windows hot dog what more could you honestly need in your life this is where windows and dare i say it computing maybe even life peaked hot dog and trackballs that have as much inertia as a set of play school roller skates. So, I guess we've reached the culmination of this video. What started as a clearly defined exclusive use medical setup to help people can now just be about used to shoot zombie faces off with a shotgun. And after all, isn't that really what we want from all medical equipment? It feels infinitely more playable. I kind of feel like this video has turned out similar to an incredibly tame version of From Dusk Till Dawn. Yeah. In composition, at least. Anyway, thanks for watching and have a great evening!